Welcome to Defense Unicorns, a podcast for mission-focused innovators. We educate, inform, and provide mission heroes with DevSecOps, cybersecurity, and organizational transformation stories from the world's leading problem solvers. I'm your host, Rob Slaughter, and we're excited for you to join us on this journey. Hi, welcome to the show today. We're honored to have Dr. Will Roper on the show. He's the former head of Air Force Acquisitions. Welcome to the show, Will. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me on. It's great to spend some time with you outside of government. You certainly did a lot of things during your time in the Air Force. So thanks for putting up with me uh, learning the ropes. Oh, no, no. It uh, blows me away how much you were able to accomplish in a short period of time. And it's, it's an honor to have you on the show. You know, of course, for a lot of the folks listening, you don't, you know, really need any introduction, but, but I'd actually love to share a little bit more about your background and, and specifically what you did before you decided to go work for the Air Force. If I, it's your podcast, Rob, so your house, your rules. I would love to know how does somebody wind up as the head of Air Force acquisitions? What type of work were you doing before that? It's a good question. I don't know if I can answer the question generally, but before I was doing the Air Force gig, I was working for Secretary Ash Carter in the Strategic Capabilities Office. And it was an office that I founded because he gave me a problem and the problem required some different approaches to building things. And the problem was to go do something about China and Russia. And that's a very open-ended task and one that now the entire department is engaged in. But I had that task when the department was still focused on counterterrorism in the Middle East, no one was working on China or Russia or great power competition. These were not wars fighting symmetrically or asymmetrically. These were not common terms. So I was given that task and I realized that the way that the current procurement system works from requirements and acquisition into fielding, it just simply wasn't responsive enough for what our war fighters needed. So I started an office and got a team together and we grew from about $10 million. And believe it or not, I sat in the food court for about half a year because I didn't have an office. That's how slow government administration works. But we took a, a bet on a single system called Standard Missile 6, hoping that we could teach it to do another job. It was a, a defensive system and we wanted to show that it could be an offensive weapon because in a fight against a peer, you, you can't afford to, you know, to have to go home and reload if you've got the wrong thing in your Aegis destroyer. It turns out the missile was very able to do that job. And it created an opportunity for me to grow the office all the way up to over one and a half billion dollars a year. And I think we fielded almost 53 programs is my recollection. Most of them classified, very classified because of the mission that we had. But we challenged the procurement system. We showed it was possible to do things like swarming in AI and military programs long before those were common buzzwords in the Pentagon. And during that time, I got to know Dave Goldfein, who was the chief of staff of the Air Force. And Dave asked me to come over and be the acquisition exec, introduced me to Heather Wilson. And I, I told him, chief, I've got the best job in the Pentagon. I've got 150 people, one and a half billion dollars a year. I'm under the cover of darkness because our office is mostly classified. It wasn't even acknowledged until Secretary Carter decided to do that for strategic reasons. And I don't have to deal with a lot of the administrivia and bureaucracy. Why would I want to come over and deal with the sclerotic acquisition of procurement process? And the chief's answer to me was a really good one is that it's only through scale are we going to be able to truly compete against adversaries like China and Russia? So I was like, damn it, chief, that's a good answer. And I should give it a try. But almost everyone in the Pentagon said all the things that you've done at the strategic capabilities office or SCO, as we called it, they're not going to work in the air force. You can't do innovation the same way you're going to have. And just so a litany of things that would scare off even the staunchest of, of, of battle hardened, uh, Washingtonians, but I tried not to listen to them and I, and I'm glad I didn't because they were all wrong. Innovation does work at a large scale. You do have to do some things differently, but you can do innovation at a large scale. And a lot of the techniques apply if you modify them. 
and just what the Air Force accomplished in, in software transformation that you, you led. I didn't write any code for the Air Force, you did. But look at what was accomplished in such a short time. So I really think we need to, to have people in those positions that are less overseers, policy experts. And we need innovators and entrepreneurs. We need people to come into organizations like CEOs often do with a vision to, to plant a new strategic initiative and grow it into the future. And if we did that more often, I, I think we would be safer as a country, our military would be readier. But the reason innovators and entrepreneurs don't do that, I now fully understand in the private sector, you can get so much done. You can move quickly without a lot of resistance. And the government is anything but that. But that's how, it's a long story of how I, I landed in that Air Force acquisition job and Space Force acquisition job during my tenure. But I loved it. I wouldn't have traded a single minute and I would have stayed and done it longer because I loved the team that I was working with. And I saw that, that really anything that we envisioned was possible as long as we were patient and getting the results through the system. You used a word that is sort of the word of the year, if not decade, innovation. How do you define innovation? Because I feel like it means something different to different people. You know, what is your definition for innovation? So I'm glad you asked that, Rob. I was pretty intentional in the Air Force not to use that term a lot. If you look back at a lot of the talks that I gave that are online on different Air Force sites, it's rare for me to say that term. I will often call things innovative, but innovation as a means in and of itself doesn't mean anything to me. I, that's my, why my focus was typically on being competitive and agile. Like I, I know how to measure whether I'm competitive because I do it against an opponent and I'm either ahead or behind. That's a very complicated calculus if you're taking it all the way up to like the Air Force or DOD level. But you can measure it and you can measure agility and, and innovation is, is really, what is it? it? It's a means to solve those types of problems, being competitive, being agile, you need innovative ideas to, to do those things, but you really need to do things that are measurable. And, and even those things like competitiveness and being agile were all under that original mission that I was given, which is help get the military ready to compete against great powers. And I felt like that was a easy continuation of what I did in the first job I had in the Pentagon, working for secretary Carter to the second one I had working for the air force. Now, even in the private sector, I feel like I'm continuing that mission. I'm very selectively picking things where I think I can make a difference to that mission. I do not want the world to come under the sway of countries that do not have the same values that I, that I, and all of us have enjoyed growing up. Our system's not perfect. I'm not going to claim anything. It's far from it, but it's working. And it, it does have a lot of, of things that I believe need to be the bedrock of how the world interacts with each other. So I'm still part of the fight, just in a different role now. You mentioned, you know, competitiveness, you mentioned agility using, you know, innovative versus innovation. What words do you use to mean the opposite of that? And what about those words are for lack of a better sort of question, like why do they still exist if, if they are the anti of, of the thing that everybody wants to support? I, I think it, in, in the case of, of uh, innovative ideas or agility, they're the antithesis of the status quo. And that status quo is not typically a bad thing. It became the status quo by some means. It replaced the previous status quo and that one, a previous status quo and so on ad infinitum. We are always in the business of replacing the status quo. And to do that, we need innovative ideas and innovative processes that, that allow us to create a, a new way of doing things that becomes the new norm. And what I see being the challenge for the military is that the status quo that it's inherited is, is twofold. It has a procurement system that is still tied to the legacy cold war era system. And then it had a counter violent extremism mission, which was really not a good mismatch for the violent counter extremism mission itself. There were many things that could have been done with more commercially inspired approaches. But I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the former since it's very important for your question. 
that legacy Cold War era acquisition system, which is typically bashed in Washington, usually by people who have never done acquisition, by the way, the strongest positions on acquisition, procurement technology are typically by people who have never done it. And I find that interesting. And I'll, I'll let you fill in why I might, but it's not a bad system. It won the Cold War. And it's hard to imagine today that there once was a time when computers were really expensive and wicked hard to make, much less code for a particular purpose. And that technology cost a lot of money to create in almost any field. It's hard to imagine that in a world today where technology is cheap and fast and you can't keep up with it, even if that's all you do as a full-time job, but, but that was the world during the war. And the military had a strategy to defeat the Soviet Union. The procurement system rallied behind it imperfectly as everything in the world is and government things particularly, but it rallied behind it. It made strategic investments over and over again in technologies like stealth and satellites and microelectronics and, and even the internet that eventually won the Cold War. And what most people don't add and went on to create the information age in our nation, the soft power benefits of that play are enormous. The companies that lead the world, the jobs that are most sought after have a U.S. zip code because of that play in the Cold War acquisition system. From that view, it's one of the most successful things to happen in government in recent times. So it's not a broken system, but when you look at the world today, it has spawned new terms and conditions that are now prevalent in the tech ecosystem. Technology is no longer expensive. It's now cheap. It's no longer slow. It's now fast. Computers are no longer unique and specialized. They're ubiquitous and generalized. The world is different. So the system needs to change. The status quo needs to be replaced. And so that's why finding ways to be more agile, to keep up with this pace of change and to do so in a way that outcompetes an adversary were the key themes for it. But that status quo won the Cold War. It created an information age. So I hope our new status quo that we're hoping for can be equally successful. Let's hope that we can achieve that last status quo milestone. So in, in your opinion, has there been enough changes in the last couple of years to, to right the ship, to, to create that new status quo? No, 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 there, there haven't been. And I, I don't know which direction the Pentagon will go. I'm hopeful because I'm a hopeful person, but I know how difficult it is to do anything disruptive in government. I know how many times I was close to being exited from government for some of the things that, that I did. Right. And that's, I, I joke now, but it wasn't a laughing matter at the time being disruptive in government is especially hard because of all of the, the apparatus that, that you've got around you. And you might think it's easier when you lead an organization because my reporting chain was pretty simple. I worked for two secretaries of the air force and they were tremendous women, tremendous leaders, tremendous visionaries, and they gave amazing top cover support. So I couldn't have had it easier for, for me on the reporting chain, but when you have thousands of overseers in the office of the secretary of defense, all checking your math and the, you know, calling shots and the you know, backseat driving you, it doesn't that plus Congress, plus the GAO plus OMB. And if you don't understand what any of these acronyms are, be thankful. Uh, all of that creates a culture and ecosystem that's waiting for someone to make a mistake and then correcting it. And then we say, thank goodness. That corrector was there, that box checker was there, but it, it creates an ecosystem where we expect things to be right the first time because taxpayer money is being spent. But you know, Rob, from what was accomplished in the Air Force, that's absolutely antithetical to entrepreneurship and innovation where being wrong is part of the process of getting to right. But the higher up you go, the more powerful the overseers and box checkers and backbiters get. It's 
easier just to stick with what the easiest path is through. And the changes that we just talked about to overwrite the Cold War system, which isn't just a procurement thing, it will change how requirements are done, how training is done, how operations are done. And the way the military playbook looks in future should be fundamentally different than anything that's on the books now, if we get it right. But all of those will be an upheaval of the system. And my prediction is that the overseers box, they will rise up as well because they are, they are experts. They are sovereign over the status quo and to see something new come, see a new kingdom, a new regime, they may not retain the, the power and oversight they have today. But I believe with, with strong conviction and leadership, it is possible to break through the bureaucracy. I've seen signs of it in the air force. I'm watching what say the Marine Corps and is doing with general Berger. I think it is possible for visionary leaders, change agents like CQ Brown, if they stick with it, you can eventually con convert enough people to your side to maintain momentum, but only if you've got a mission that's compelling and changing to compete against China and Russia is, and then you've got the, the right methodologies to produce signs of hope early enough to avoid being shut down. And, and that is, that's contradictory to the getting it right first. So there's a little bit of, of conflict in what I just said, right? You've got to get things wrong to get them right. But you also need to pr produce some signs of hope soon enough that you don't get shut down. And that's why my approach to doing change in government was very focused on what the first thing was in any new initiative. What is the first demonstrable result and why I was typically personally involved in getting to it? Because it was so critical with that one result, that one flash or spark of, of new brilliance. You could push back on the pressure that was trying to collapse the initiative. Like Kessel Run, as an example, that, that was a great example of how bureaucracies respond. Stand up a new organization, make it a major defense program that looks very different than anyone in the past. Level of effort funding, because it's based around a process, not a product. The acquisition system looks at level of effort funding and says that's sloppy acquisition. You clearly don't know what you're buying. We said, but it's a process. That's exactly the right way to do it. We, we manage it by metrics. The number of times the budget for Kessel Run was under attack from multiple sources in Washington, I've lost count on. It was a fight to keep it alive as a program and not turned into something else. But it produced some flashes of, of newness, things that had not been done in government software that allowed us to push back on the collapse of the bubble and spawn new software factory after factory after factory, we could clone that model because we had proved it was doable and defensible. And ultimately that cloning process created a culture change that ultimately created a program change. And I would say the air force became pretty good at software compared to where it was when I entered and I'll put it above everyone else in the government right now, based on, on my experience working with it. So. You can make it work, but if that first flash doesn't occur soon enough, then you get pushed back into a, a small corner. And that's, that's really the fight that leaders are going to have. They're going to have big ideas. The reality of watching is you have to show some measurable progress toward them. And if you can do that soon enough and then protect against all the mistakes that happen before you get there, you know, try to make them smaller mistakes, things that you know, are mistakes that are falling forward, failing fast so that you're learning to get better, then you can do it. But it's, it's a calculus, Rob, that I, every day I would question, are we taking on too much? And the risk is that we may not be able to produce a good result soon enough. Are we taking on too little to ensure we succeed, but no one's going to care because it's not different enough. And every day I would go back and forth of, was I towing the balance, right? It's a very difficult calculus. So I, I don't envy those who are, who are in power right now in Washington, having to do their own calculus of how to get new things through the system. It's very, very challenging. So talk a little bit about 
when success it does happen, that change does happen. In your opinion, is that more top down or, or bottom up? It's both. And I know that's a common thing to say, but let me explain very specifically why it's both. If you're doing a, a true overhaul of a system that has to change everything about it, that ultimately requires top down. And as we just discussed, bureaucracies often don't want those very large changes. So they will try to hold the status quo because the status quo was important for past reasons and they're there to ensure that it, it maintains. So they're keeping the train running. You want to change the train to something else on a different set of tracks. So I found that I had to have the vision for something and have a team designated to do it that the Air Force knew was directly connected to me. There was nothing I would not do to help them succeed. And we were tracking towards that success, that flash of brilliance we could use to push back on the collapse of the new thing. And, but then I was also looking at is the way we're creating this, this result, this new product or process, is it a Petri dish that can never be put as part of the organization? Or is it a template that can be replicated and scaled? And when I was able to make them templates, people that I never talked to took the template and replicated and, and made value and success without leadership or top level direction, or even top cover having to be involved. I think it's, it's easier to do Petri dishes. And if you look at Washington, it looks like a lot of Petri dishes, little self-contained, little innovation ecosystems, but they don't touch the big organization. They don't touch the big process. And because of that, they just stay isolated and they typically go away after the leaders who started them depart. It's hard to have a template that's scalable, but that, that's, that was my guiding light. I would actually call these lightning bolts. It's like, it needs to be a head in the clouds idea that comes from on, on high, but it also needs to touch and energize the ground. And if it doesn't do both, it's not going to work. It has to, it has to be big enough to turn heads, but it has to be implemented, implementable in a way that can be done and scaled across organization. I question that balance most days as well. Am I, am I too much head in the clouds or am I too much feet on the ground or am I, am I getting the balance right? Yeah. So it sounds very daunting to somebody at the more junior level to, to hear, you know, as, as a head of Air Force acquisitions, the struggles that you went through, you know, what advice do you have for somebody who, you know, might be junior enlisted, junior officer, civilian, you know, junior GS somewhere in the government, like what recommendations or advice do you have for them? So that way they can sort of challenge their own local status quo and, and become one of these lightning bolts. There, I'm sure there are counter examples to this, but I found there to be a, a fractal like self similarity in government that the higher up you went, the problems were really the same as what you encountered at smaller scales. The opportunity was bigger, but the resistance was bigger. So if you're not a, a head of air force acquisition, I guess there's only one person that can, that would be in that camp, whatever level you're at in, in government, the thing that you should really look at is what your, what your opportunities are and make a change that's commensurate with those opportunities. And what I have found is that once you get custom to this process that that we're discussing, this idea of having an idea, a head in the clouds idea that can touch the ground, that fits within the authorities that you have. And if you don't have those authorities, there's a lot of things in government that have to be done through encouragement and team building and consensus building. So if your idea isn't compelling enough to gain consensus, you might question the idea. Typically, my, my experience has been that Ideas create teams on their own. People want to be part of important things. They want to be part of doing things that haven't been done before. 
So my advice to you is find something that hasn't been done before that's energizing, that will make everyone's job more important. Pull together a team around it, including everyone who will have to touch that idea to make it a reality. Don't let anyone join the, the play in act two. Have everyone be part of the, of the team, of the cast at the, at the first time the curtain comes up so that they're, they're owners of it. My experience has been that people rally around that and that they happen if you have the details of execution correctly. If you can't pull people together around your idea, it may not be the right idea for the organization. I, I find good ideas naturally energize change agents and change agents have a good instinct for good ideas. On that topic, do you think that people within the status quo recognize some good ideas as threats? and will will sometimes go after some of those good ideas? It's, I, I have seen that on occasion. I have seen this fiefdom mentality that I don't want anything to change the amount of authority that I have in government. I have definitely seen the seat at the head of the conference room table. The, just the fact that there is a seat at the head of it completely change the dynamic of, of organizations, people working their entire career to be in that seat. And then once they're there, they want it to be exactly the way it was when they were inspired to do it. And you know, I, I, I think that, that there's, there's nothing wrong with, with aspiring to things, but the things we aspire to in, in, in my, in my view of the world need to subserve to some overarching mission. And that fiefdom mentality does not serve mission is my experience. So I, I, Rob, I think the, the thing I would wish for, you know, for, for government employees is that jobs were not defined based on a triage of the entire military. Like we basically create a taxonomy. We go from the military to the branches of the military, to the different divisions and the different branches all the way down to platforms and even subsystems within those platforms. And we assign people to them. And if the budgets for those components go up, their job is more important. They're rewarded. If their budgets go down, then they must not have done a good job. It, it creates this fiefdom mentality, this partisan mentality that does not subserve to the greater mission. The Navy wants the Navy to be bigger. The Air Force wants the Air Force to be bigger. And within the Air Force, you know, the, the F-15 community wants it to be the biggest program. And that fiefdom mentality does not allow agility. I wish people's jobs were assigned based on function and the same kind of flexibility and agility that you see within special operational forces was applicable there. The same agility you see in the startup world was applicable there. But when you tell someone their job is platform A, whatever flavor of job they have under it, then their job is to ensure platform A maintains as close to the front of the stage as possible with as much of the spotlight on it as possible. And that simply keeps the status quo perpetuated. They're all there to keep something in play that was handed to them by someone else, which is not going to help us be agile and competitive in the future. You know, you probably have an amazing perspective of this because you managed a you know, massive budget within the Air Force, what percentage of funds that, that go to the services or, or maybe in this case specific to the Air Force, do you believe go to those innovative, agile efforts versus the percentage of funds that go to the status quo? I'll have to do some math in public, Rob. It's dangerous to do that. It's, it's not a lot if you're just looking at the line of accounting itself, you've got the SBIR budget for the Air Force, which is a few billion dollars. And I think, I think AFWorks and the Air Force as a whole have done a great job of being the friendly service for the startup community to work with. It's not perfect yet, but certainly has gotten further along than anyone else in government. And I can tell you from working now in the investment community still has a very good rep amongst investors. So there's a few billion there. There's a few billion in the laboratory that I wish was transitioning more capability to warfighters and working more with the private sector. And a, a smat, probably a, you know, a billion or so of smattering of initiatives. 
So on paper, there's not a lot that's, that's bookmarked for innovation in and of itself. And as we let off this podcast with what really is innovation and, you know, you know, it, it's, it's apparent if everything is innovative, then clearly nothing is, but I found that you could really bake innovation into any program. There was no program that was exempt from thinking creatively. There was no program that was exempt from trying to challenge its own status quo. Every program should be trying to put new process, new thinking into it. And so programs like sustainment programs, you know, brought 3D printing of parts in and how to certify them. And that's very creative thinking. In many respects, the Air Force is the leading aerospace organization, especially for safety critical uh, parts. There's a lot that we learned from the private sector though, to, to get into that, into that ball game. The F-16 program did amazingly creative work in and modernizing their software platform that, that's driven by the government. The U2 team put an AI co-pilot on the U2. It's the first time AI has controlled a military system. You know, space camp for you, right? Was developing capabilities that went to the operational floor for space force. So those are in big programs, but there there's innovation that got put in all of them. And that's ultimately where this will happen. It will start by doing innovation inside of legacy programs. And there is a huge substrate that you can attach multiple commercial innovative processes and technologies to, but then the Herculean task is we have to change the procurement system. So it doesn't continue buying things the way it did in the cold war, where only a handful of very widely diversified portfolio companies, the defense primes can deal with the sparsity of programmatic opportunity. You know, right now the air force is working on next generation air dominance system. When will be the next, next generation air dominance system? Well, if it's 30 years from now, then what will the state of our, our tactical aircraft industry be? If there's that big of a gap, very few companies that can deal with that. And that's why the industrial base for defense continues to collapse. You know, the, the B-21 bomber is a great example. If you go to that program and query a lot of the people that you can tell might not be the new hires in the room, a lot of them are there from the B-2 program. They moved over and, and, and the new people coming in, if we don't change the system will be the veteran force whenever the next, next bomber is, if it's decades into the future, there's just not enough opportunity that's well-timed in the defense pipeline for commercial companies to hazard it. And it's exceptionally dangerous. Even if you've got the right timing programmatically, then you've got the timing of the budget process itself and the timing of the valley of death, right? Which is, so you've got three big things. You've got the timing of the program. You've got the timing of dollars from the budget, and then you've got the valley of death. So do we think we're going to get any new companies in the industrial base that can build not just software or commercially relevant technology, but that can, can build major platforms like a, like a fighter. The answer is probably not. Now, there's a few examples. I, you know, there are a few companies that came into the air force that are, are building like major aircraft that, that I hope will succeed, but that's because they were riding a pretty impressive capital market and there's no guarantee that'll stay. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for the mid to senior leaders who might be, you know, the program managers or, or maybe some type of acquisition type authority of some of those legacy systems to sort of flip the script on how do you take this legacy system and turn it into something that, that is innovative, that is agile. What advice do you have for those people? You know, I th if you're, if you're the, the, the lead of any of them, you have to start by finding your innovators and disruptors and protecting them. Most of them in the air force were at the captain level and you definitely saw a difference in how they were treated and listened to based on rank. And I wish I had just had a big bag full of stars. I could have gone around and billed out, could have changed things very quickly, but leaders can give that direct top cover support. And that I see that in a lot of components of, of the government, but the air force, especially where you have a very senior leader that 
that will listen to a very, you know, young airman because they got the technical chops. They got the skill. They got the, the, the most relevant time in the seat. You hit the big bureaucracy, that mentality goes away. But one leader with that top cover can change the dynamic and make that person a change agent. And then listen to them. You know, understand, understand the ideas that they have. You are supposed to bring the experience of how to take a new idea and navigate it through whatever system you find yourself in. And then empower them to go make that change within the boundary constraints that you put in place. And most of the time, empowered people with the right top cover and the right resources succeed. Okay. One of the things that you talked about was the shrinking defense industrial base. Why is that such a concern? If you go back to the mission I'm trying to affect in my, my life, making the military more competitive and dominant against great powers, that's not going to be the case if we're working with an ever shrinking industrial base. And I also am not a knocker of the defense primes either. What has happened to them is not, I, I let me back up Rob and say something about this. This is an important point. I cannot tell you how many times I've been in a meeting where someone in government talks about the, what the business case of a defense prime is doing to the service. Like it's like, it's coming into us from industry and we can't change it. And I will stop that discussion every time and say, it's not that direction. It's the other way. We lead the dance off. It's our contract. Our contract has incentives in them and industry performs based on those incentives. The industry didn't decide to make every new aircraft program be decades apart. The government made that decision. We forced industry to go out and buy a lot of other companies, diversify its portfolio so that it could build an aircraft one year. And then a few years later, build a submarine. And then a few years later, build a combat vehicle. And a few years later, build a radar. And that's what has created the defense primes. They have had to broadly diversify their portfolio because the opportunities in any one specialized area are so far between. That's not industry's business case. That's our business case. And then if you win one of those generational programs, you need to lock into that program, keep your team relevant, keep cash flow coming in because there's not another program coming anytime soon. The lock in mentality of the defense primes is a survival mechanism for them. They're in a cap market, they're cash flow driven. And if they make a wrong choice with their IRAD, if they don't properly invest to keep capturing new programs so that cash keeps coming in the door, most of what they develop, they can't go put out on the private sector in the private market. They're, they can't sell it to other militaries and in the cases they can, it takes years. So they're playing an existential game, looking at their IRAD investment, their internal research and development, having to capture programs and then holding on to them, including all of the sustainment and trying to keep them in the field for generations, because that is predictable cash flow, which makes them more stable to get the next capture. That is the government's doing. We can change any of that with the stroke of a pen on a contract by changing the incentives in the contract and the frequency of those contractual opportunities. That's why I was pushing that very heavily in next generation air dominance as a way that we can avoid having tactical aviation collapse to, to two, one vendor, you know, who knows how far we could go down, right? I wanted to keep more people engaged in building tactical aircraft. And I also wanted to have more opportunities for companies to come in. But if what the government keeps doing is saying, nope, we can save, we can save money. If we do one program, we go into mass production and buy a lot of them. And then we keep them for a long time. That's going to save us money. It, it may save you procurement dollars, but you are going to pay that back and then some in sustainment. And the math holds that up. Old things are hard to maintain. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to prove that. 
You're going to pay it back on the back end, even though you save on the front end. But then more important, you're threatening your competitiveness in two ways. You have a static system that is not upgrading and your adversary knows it, right? So that's thing one. Thing two is you are threatening that whoever built your last system, for whatever reason, it may not be in their interest to keep that business unit. It may be too expensive to keep those people, it may be easier to reassign them to other parts of the business and, and they do well there. So they, they don't have the bandwidth to come back. Now, I think, I think we've become very comfortable, very comfortable in the U S it's all going to be okay because we haven't had a peer competitor. We haven't felt an existential threat in such a long time that you know, even violent extremism, as tough as it was, no one felt like if if we made a bad choice that somehow the place of the U.S., the opportunities in the U.S., the economy of the U.S., the safety of the U.S. would be at risk. But that is the game now in Washington. There are no safe decisions anymore vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. They are gone. We are back to the era where decisions matter and you can't come back from them. And with the industrial base, if the government does not make the right decision, we can lose a competitive industrial base just like that and have a nationalized one. And you can see what a nationalized industrial base could be like for the Air Force if, if you look at other parts of the military procurement. I'll, I'll let you fill in what ones those are. We do not want that to happen. More importantly, we want to encourage more companies to come in. Given how you know, given how, you know, important we see drones being in the, in the horrible incidences in Ukraine. I mean, is there an opportunity to encourage new drone companies with military budgets that are, are going to be up? Yes. How would you encourage that with, with sufficient opportunities and incentives to make it worthwhile for industry to come work with us? Could we catalyze or encourage a company to come work with the air force or maybe start even start a company? based on that. Yes. If the incentives are there. So not a good answer for me, Rob, here in the end, I've digressed. I'm just going into things happen in the world, but this, this, this is a core thing. I think people feel like that decisions that are just made program after program that somehow like it's going to be okay. And it's not changing the boundary conditions. And, you know, I, I just, I worry that, that the boundary conditions will change because if the business case isn't there, see as a companies have a fiduciary responsibility, they have to make the right choice for the company, no matter how patriotic they feel, they, they can't not do that. And if the government puts them in a position where their fiduciary responsibility compels them to make a decision that is not in the long-term government's interest. And the government just lost access to whatever that was in the company. And that is a big deal. That is something that if, if left unabated, we will find ourselves with, with nationalized industrial bases around legacy systems. We will have yesterday's industrial base building yesterday's technology to be ready to fight yesterday's war. When the future war, future industrial base, future technology looks nothing like that. And the thing we've prepared so much money, so much effort, so much training to be ready to do everything can be overwritten by, by new techniques, new technologies, new companies that have the vision, the drive, and that are not, that are not encumbered by process and bureaucracy. So I'll end by saying the thing that I would wish for anyone going into Washington in the future is just to have that reverence that it is not going to be okay if we make the wrong decisions and that starts today, today counts. So are you making the right decisions today? And if you lose today, there is going to eventually be a day where the answer is you don't come back from it. And if more people have that kind of attitude going in, then I think we will, we will put the focus into decisions that they deserve and not simply serve the status quo because it's easier to do on that day. So that was amazing. And there's so many questions that I have, but one of the things that immediately sort of came to mind when you think about startups, small businesses entering a new market and disrupting the market leaders, traditionally in the commercial world, that means a market change. It literally means that company A goes out of business typically 
or gets acquired at a much lower valuation than where their peak was. I mean, somebody new comes in to give you, I'm sure I could give you a ton of examples, but Netflix doesn't become Netflix without Blockbuster, you know, effectively going, going away. You know, Amazon doesn't become Amazon without a bunch of retailers going out of business. What happens if that valley of death goes away? Is it acceptable? for large defense primes to effectively go out of business? Or is that something that the nation is fearful of and therefore as a status quo, actually trying to prevent? So it's a great question, Rob. And the way I view it is the money for defense is the money for defense. And there will, there will certainly be a desire to not have startups or commercial companies get any of that money for defense because more can go to established defense companies. But let's set aside that and say, we take a portion of the defense company, of the defense budget should go to commercial entities. And by the way, a small portion of the defense budget is huge in the private sector and it's stable. So even a small portion can, can change the U S tech landscape and create new industrial revolutions, just like our investments in the cold war created the information, which is very possible. Well, once you quotient out the amount of money that's going to non-traditional commercial companies, the rest is for defense companies. And it's up to the government decide what business case do you want to create? Do you want those companies to make most of their money in sustainment, or do you want them to make most of their money in research and development, new ideas? Right now, our procurement system and the requirements process and the way it becomes a budget, which I think is the biggest culprit of all, all say you will make your money in sustainment and it creates all of the behaviors that we see. If the government changed its entire process, which would not just be changing the valley of death. The valley of death will help a startup get across in theory, but get across to what? Most startups are not going to build a full military platform unless it's a very niche thing. They're going to be part of a bigger program. So if we change the cadence of programs and the incentives of defense companies, to keep innovating, to keep upgrading, to keep improving using industry 4.0 technology, you know, at, in digital engineering, agile software and, and advanced manufacturing, then there would be lots of places to plug commercial technology and startup technology into defense programs. We've already taken their segment out of the budget, but now it becomes a competitive advantage for defense companies to be able to work with startups and plug and play their technology in the military platforms and to do it safely, that could happen. It's not as hopeless as people think, but it takes the system being changed. But I'll go ahead and say it, that the first thing that wouldn't be liked about a system like this is that the first disconnect is going to be letting go of legacy systems. And those legacy systems are loved by many in Washington, but including people in Congress who don't want to see them go. And there's just a lot of parochialism and that's the way our system of government works. People represent states and, and districts, and I am all for that, but, but there will, it will take a confluence of leaders who realize that if we keep fueling that fire, eventually there'll be no fire to fuel. And that system for the U S military seems awesome. If we had a procurement system that was continually creating new programs or upgrades for programs that were fast in frequency, but smaller in scale. So they were affordable with incentives to encourage R and D and a way for companies across the Valley, then the U S military might feel more like the automotive industry where you expect systems to get better every year. You walk down a you know, a, an aircraft line and say, that's a 2024 or 2025. And that means that there's something different and better about it, as opposed to what we have today on average 23 year old airplanes in the U S air force and much of the technology still there from the day it was born. And, you know, you, you talked a, lot, a little bit about the Valley of death 
and you've also introduced, you know, not only on, you know, the, the podcast, but also when you were serving in the Air Force, the, you know, this concept of small batch sizes in order to develop more iterations on technology. Does the valley of death change or at least the emphasis of what parts of the valley of death? So a lot of times people talk valley of death, things like acquisition, they talk testing, they talk digital engineering, they talk accreditation. It means a lot of different things. When you transition to small batch sizes, does the valley of death change and the difficulty of some of those components now matter more than others? Yeah, if, if you change, if you do what we've just discussed, Rob, there is no valley. It, it would change in a heartbeat if the frequency of programs was high and the incentives of industry was to do more R&D and less sustainment. Now that means we're going to pay more for systems, Rob. That's going to be a challenge in Washington. I mean, the price we pay for an aircraft in procurement in Washington, we track that number. No one ever grilled me on sustainment dollars for aircraft, but that's where we pay 70% of the aircraft's cost. So we get a cheap aircraft and it's certainly not cheap, but it's a cheaper aircraft because we're amortizing the true cost of ownership over sustainment. It's very similar to buying a smartphone where if you get a free phone, no one thinks they're getting the phone for free. You know, you're being locked into a relationship with a service provider. And in many cases, people are okay with that. If you buy an iPhone from Apple, you pay a high price, but it's your phone. You can go wherever you want. If we do what I'm suggesting, we would pay more on the sticker price of the system. The more Apple like model, we would give industry a fairer compensation for that significant research and development we're incentivized because they're not going to be able to amortize their cost over a 20 or 30 year program. That's going to be a very difficult sell in Washington. Most people have gotten very comfortable tracking the procurement price, but it's only a small cost of ownership. So that's really, that is my meteor of the war. When that first program that can successfully defend paying a higher sticker price or procurement price, because it's going to be retired earlier, because we're going to keep upgrading the capabilities, the first victory on that battlefield will encourage others. And once that happens and it starts scaling, now you've got lots of places to plug startups in. The valley is there because the opportunities to plug startups in are so few and far between. So rather than ask like how to get across the valley of death, it's better just to fill it in and not have there be a valley at all. So the trend is actually in the opposite direction. And so if you look at GBSD and its life expectancy, you look at Columbia and those systems and their life expectancy, you know, a lot of these major ACAT ones by design. Are, are actually trending in the opposite direction, even if they're systems that haven't yet fielded. So, so what breaks that? How do we take, if, if somebody were to acknowledge what you said is true, how does anyone break the trend? You've got to do, you, so first, if, if you're already at the end of competition or your own contract, you're too late to do the change. It's all about aligning incentives with industry, telling them, this is what we want. This is what we want you to invest in. Here's how we're going to select you. So if it's a legacy program, you have to accept it's fixed, it's frozen. I can't change it. And you have to create a new program at a time, new major program at a time. So for me, the opportunity to do this was really on a program like NGAT, where it was early enough for me to be able to think about now, how do we how do we think about procurement differently so we don't create the same collapse dynamic of the industrial base that is actually coupled to and driving the valley of death? And I, I liked this idea of the century series from the early Air Force, not because any of those airplanes were great airplanes. They were very dangerous. I'm not wanting to recreate the planes, but I like the idea that that period of the Air Force, they were good with the fact that air power was really in flux. Supersonic flight was now possible for everyday pilots, not test pilots. Nuclear weapons were on tactical airplanes. And so air power was existential. 
choices matter. And the Air Force accepted building one and only one airplane was too fragile, too much of a single point of failure during a time of such change and flux. And so it was content with building a variety of different systems by a variety of different aircraft companies. And there were, there were, I think, 13 that were still around providing aircraft during the, the early period. It was okay with that. And, and it was able to put together a portfolio of, of air power that was able to deter the Soviet Union. And now we certainly can't return to that era, but I liked the idea of a, of a program embracing that it might be okay to have multiple things that were leapfrogging each other in a pipeline that gave industry base more opportunity to, to bring new ideas in where the victories weren't huge anymore, because we're not going to award really big lots of airplanes, you know, hundreds or thousands, where it's a winner take all the vic the victories are smaller, but the defeats are smaller. That's, that's really what, what the government needs to do. Now the counter to this will be, but will, when you have smaller lots of aircraft, you're going to lose your economic order quantities and it's not affordable anymore. And that, that was a, that was a real argument. It, it has been a necessary argument to do mass production because we have to make systems affordable. And when you create something new, you should go ahead and buy a lot of it because it's going to take a long time, a lot of money to do something else. But industry 4.0, digital engineering, digital transformation, it changes that. But we're watching that change the way multiple industries work. And, and if properly done, you don't have to pay a disproportionate premium for small batch production. And we saw hints of that in the T7 program with its lower costs. We've seen hints of that in GBSD with the much lower engineering hours in. So there's the technology that can fuel doing smaller scale, iteratively upgrading lots of systems with the right incentives and programmatic frequency from the government. There's your new system. There's your agile system. And it's one where the dot com ecosystem can work with the dot mill ecosystem because we've leveled, we've leveled the opportunity and we've made the victories and defeats not existential anymore. Right now in the defense budget, they are existential. There are must win scenarios for, for many defense companies. And that's when they're at the most vulnerable. That's when the behavior becomes the most draconian. That's when the government's also being the least responsible. So, you know, this podcast is really about, you know, connecting innovators to the thought leaders and the people who have, who have, you know, gone through it successfully and, and sharing those lessons learned. And, and one of the things that I like to ask every guest on here, because of how common it is, you know, innovation always gets celebrated at the end, but people always forget the struggle it took to get there. And so, you know, odds are the people listening to the show, it's, it's probably more likely to be a down point than it is an up point because of how common the low points are. And so one of the things I, you know, I, I, I know I'd value tremendously would be, you know, hearing your thoughts on, you know, some of your thought patterns for how you push through your own low points, because, you know, as you mentioned, you've had some to, to actually get towards, you know, some semblance of a finish line, you know, do you have any insights or recommendations or, you know, war stories for people? The number of scars would be fit for, for any bar across any city of the U S yeah, there are many scars from failures and I don't, I wish, I wish there were more opportunities to share them with, you know, with, with teams. I think leaders are very guarded with their mistakes and the mistakes that are shared are you know, they're, they're not really mistakes. Right. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you one as an example. It was a real low point for me when I was at the strategic capabilities office, I I had made a, I made a big push on electromagnetic rail guns. And I, I once was the single biggest funder of electromagnetic rail guns in the U S probably the world. And I found out because I was so focused on the technology and what it could do that the industrial base was not ready to scale completely missed that because I had so many people that were throwing stones at the idea that I had, which was that an electromagnetic railgun could shoot down a cruise missile or a ballistic missile. You literally could hit a bullet with a bullet, not a, not a missile with a missile. And so I was so focused on proving that, that I missed the industrial base angle 
And then as I was pushing funding to the program, I realized I didn't have the industrial base that could, that could scale me. That was a very big downtime. And the, the reason I, 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 the reason that I am here to talk to you about it is that I was able to find a way to, to deal with this problem. So if you don't, I, I probably wouldn't have kept running the office. I would have gotten to be in the air force. So that, that needs to change. Most people in government, when they have their failure and their downtime, do find a way to get to success, but it's not always possible. And if you find yourself in a place where it's not possible for you, you know, th sometimes that's just reality, but I found myself there and there were a couple of things that, that could have been temptations that I, I avoided and I'm glad I did because they've, they've been fundamental to my career. First was, pr was protecting the negative. I know this thing and I could try to find a way to keep the program going in a way that doesn't, doesn't like lose space. I mean, it's not, it wasn't that the capability wouldn't work. I just couldn't build it at a big enough quantity. And I, I, I remember just, I remember having that thought that I could, I can still protect this. And I, it was just so clear to me driving home. I was like, I have to live in reality. The, I will never live in an artificial governmental reality that is separated from the mission. The mission requires scale. I will live in a real universe where scale is a factor. And so I, I went and explained to a lot of the, the budget overseers and both OSD as well as Congress and elsewhere. Now I, I tried to go in with a solution and say, now this thing doesn't work. This rail gun doesn't, but I think if we put the same rail gun munition in a traditional cannon or tank that we can do the same thing. It's just chemical propellant now, not electrical propellant. And I gave the analysis and I was expecting to have the, you know, the, the world in, but the, the response I got from everyone, oh, Congress, OSD, my, my bosses was great, great. You know, thanks for telling us this looks good. Go ahead. It was a non event, like after what I thought was going to be a career ending move for me. And so what was very formative for me leaving that was live in the real universe that subserves to the mission, not to protecting your reputation. Secondly, always be honest, tell people bad news when you know it, don't do them the discourtesy of letting them live in the artificial reality you created with the information that you gave them. And thirdly, bring solutions. Do not bring problems. If you simply can't have a solution, if things broken beyond repair, then just apologize at that point. I've done that many times in my career. Just say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. But bring solutions. And if you do those three things, nine times out of 10, there's a way to keep going. That is not gonna hurt someone's career. It's not gonna put the leader they work for at risk and shows the kind of agility that, that we need to have in government where people make mistakes, I think, is they hold on to the artificial reality for too long until it crumbles around them. But at that point, and at that point, they, they certainly haven't done the courtesy of taking the people around them to the real universe because they're still living in the artificial one. So they, they broken number two and there's no time for number three. There's no time for solutions. So by doing this, you give yourself the most time to recover. And, you know, if you've got a good team and you've got, you know, good resources and enough time, that, that debilitating mistake may end up being the best idea you had because it forced you to be creative. And, you know, years after I made that pivot in the strategic capabilities office, the air force used that technology to shoot down a cruise missile surrogate at one of the advanced battle management system demonstrations. So I got to be at the beginning of it and then see at the end that that pivot not only, you know, kept the program alive, but now it's possible to do that kind of thing, shoot down cruise missiles with, with tanks, not with a handful of electronic rail guns, but with systems that we have thousands of and our allies and partners do too. So that was a very pivotal moment for me. And if I hadn't taken that course of action, I'm sure 
I wouldn't be talking with you today. Well, the, the last question I have for you and, you know, you're, you know, part of our first season on the podcast. And so, you know, one of our last questions that we ask every guest is, is why should listeners keep, you know, listening to the podcast? I think. Well, Rob, one is that you're hosting it and you are a rock star in the Air Force. So any, any time you've got a rock star bringing in people, there's a good chance they're people that are going to have something to share of value. And the reason I would give you other than, than you and your team here is that you can learn a lot from other people's experiences. You can avoid mistakes that you would have made otherwise, even even sometimes for people that you don't like or agree with, you can learn the most to become a better leader, a better innovator, like learning what not to do is equally valuable. And, and where those things fail, I think encouragement is finally a good thing. It is good to know it is not easy. It is not. It is good to know that failures occur. They do. But I'm a be believer that if engaged, if engaged the right way, that, that that, that people typically find a way is my experience. And if you leave with nothing more than just trusting that if you're hazarding the, the, the billows of government to, to do good things and you don't see your way through right now, that everyone on the show has, has been there, they can tell you their stories, but if you stick to your ideals and values most of the time you're going to find a way and take encouragement from that. Trust yourself. If you are carrying the torch, that alone is a reason why I respect you and want to be on your team and help you carry that torch. Trust yourself to hold it a little longer and see if you find that way. Well, just want to say thank you. It's an absolute personal pleasure and honor. You know, you've been so impactful, not only across the entire Air Force, but, but also for me personally. You know, you, you always, always took, you know, random emails, please help, please help. Because, you know, it's sometimes it does take a senior leader and, and you were always in the corner of progress and innovation and in changing of the status quo. And so I'm sure I speak for a lot of folks that, that are listening to just say that thank you so much for not only your past service, but what sounds like continued support to benefit the mission. Thanks, Rob. I, I'm, I'm. I did what I could. I really got to work with great people. That's why anything happened. If I, if I was able to hold a torch for long enough to show a path that was otherwise hidden, I, I may can take a little credit for that, but the team did it and that includes you. And, you know, now that I'm in a new gig, I, I've, I've got a reason to, to now shoot you an email to say, Hey, Rob, I need help. Can you please help me? So, <laughs> you know, this universe is full of boomerangs. Awesome. Well, well, this concludes the show. Thanks again, Will, so much.